the door has seen better days. The layer of paint has started to peel off due to the salt and wind from the sea. Even the lock looks slightly rusted. I'll wait outside to give you some time and privacy to check out your new living arrangement. But just so you know, after we are done with the day, I'll still be staying in the whirling in rags for the night. We'll meet in front of the shack in the morning. The key turns with a satisfying click. You can enter the shack now. coastal wind still howls against the window of the shack. Occasionally, the waves crawl in under the foundation, producing a low hum. The room feels muffled, like you pulled your hat over your ears. Outside, it is cold and windy, but you're inside, and it feels safe and warm. What is this place to you? Westward, across the canal, towers the whirling in rags. Door number one on the second floor is locked. Behind it lies a trashed room. One floor below, behind the counter, stands an irritable man. In a small shack in the fishing village, a baroque heater hums quietly, emanating a sense of comforting warmth. A wash basin lies on the table. The water inside reflecting the somber face of the world. Far away, on the corner of Perdition and the Main, a nondescript building, obscured in a haze. It's vacant and lost, just like its tenant. Outside, the howl of the wind has picked up. The waves crash against the stilts again. It's as if you think the thought but in someone else's voice. Look under the floorboards. On the table, you see a bowl of water, a rough soap, and next to it, a small hand mirror. A straight razor soaks inside the wash basin. The water reflects back a vague image of your face, nose bulbous and red. Hair unkempt, wrinkles lining the eyes and forehead. The stash is gigantic. You'll be looking like a pansy without the chops. A fucking pansy. Like an artist with a brush or a master swordsman, you use the small mirror and the straight razor with some soap to remove all that unkempt hair from below the nose line. The sharp blade chafes against your skin producing a scratching sound. The surface underneath the bed feels tender, the air brushing against it chilly. They feel so smooth, surprisingly so. A feeling of freshness overcomes you, as if you just came from a cold bath. The water reflects back a vague image of your clean-shaven face. Despite the bulbous nose, unkempt hair, and persistent swelling, you look a little younger, maybe. The beardless nature of your cheeks makes the expression seem even more like a terrifying grimace. An old mirror hangs on the wall. You see your reflection in it. The expression fixed to your clean-shaven face. You're still not accustomed to it. is comforting, if a bit run down. Still, 
you've earned the rest. Officer, anything I can help you with? A fishing village on the seashore. This place doesn't really have a name. It's sometimes called Illicibla. The sign on the street leading here is illegible. Has been since they built this place. The name is Lillian. People call me Net Picker. I think I have time for questions. And that was actually the second one. Indeed, you're always confused as to your whereabouts. Ask her about the cool sword. Helps to break the ice. Let's see. Who are you looking for? I don't think I know what these are. Care to elaborate? Aha! Like snowmen. Two old guys have been wandering around here, nose in sand, talking nonsense about snowmen and the like. I don't really know. Further down the peninsula, I guess. I mean, that's where they were heading. Who else are you looking for besides snowmen? Well, how can I assist you then, officer? Like I said, fish mostly. Sail the waves, take care of the kids, pick nets. Right now I'm tarring a little skiff. Sometimes I also walk to the beach to see what the sea has given up. The sea is full of surprises. This is what is called a conversation. You don't have to be guarded right now. Wood, pieces of glass. Every once in a while we see dead bodies. Human, animal, fish, other odd sea creatures. A mine washed ashore once. Bottles, drugs also, lost cargo in general. Most of the time it's just wood and glass. All right, major choice moment. You only get to ask one thing. It would be weird to say them all. Choose wisely. Mines, mines. You need mines. Well, the RCM has to wait for another one because some army folks came by, took it in the middle of the bay and blew it up. The blast was surprisingly timid for such a huge spiky thing. Unfortunately, the factory sold this one with a three-year warranty instead of a story. <laughs> it's to intimidate folks, mostly. Not really. I know some basic moves, and I know it sure as hell beats a knife when you're in a tough spot. Guns are expensive and fragile, I think. Besides, I got kids, can't have guns around them and sometimes a sharp blade is enough to keep folks at bay. 
from time to time, people need a lesson in respect. That's just the way it is. Back in the day, I caught the eyes of many men. <laughs> and believe me, men need a lesson in manners from time to time. What makes you think we haven't? <laughs> the truth is that almost everyone in this life is scared and tired and stupid and too dull for that. That goes for men too. But they put on an act for us. Pretend like everything's good and living in shit doesn't bother them. Like anyone falls for that. That does not go for real men. It does not go for you. Show her. Show her the wonder. Coach means the expression. Oh? Believe me, everyone here is a proper man. Must be something about poverty that makes all the men real. Sounds like she prefers her men to be less real. No, I'm afraid not. Tempting to confiscate the blade I used to keep these animals in check. You would put me in an early grave. Some went to patch their wounds, their lesson learned. Others were more thick-headed. And one of them, I ended up marrying. Gone. To the waves. The sea took him. It was a long time ago. He didn't respect the sea. Went out there, drunk like a skunk, and sure enough, one day, the boat was found floating empty. The bloated corpse turned up two weeks later. Now, before you tell me how sorry you are for my loss, know that it was four years ago, and I've moved on. There's only so much mourning you can do for a drunk with sinewy muscles. She really likes those muscles, though. It's in the way she pronounces sinewy. Us working folk don't have the luxury to be bedsick with melancholy. I buried him, mourned for an appropriate amount of time, and went on. Life didn't really change that much for me and the kids. This is neither a touchy nor a very interesting topic for her. She looks like she's ready to go on a date with another, better, drunk. Ask her. Both of you could need some action. Do it! Hit on the widow! It's the right thing to do! Sure is. The sun, I call her, coated with a fresh layer of tar just yesterday. It'll take some time for it to dry, assuming the sunny days continue. Hi. Sunny days. You got a problem with that? No, ma'am. We have no quarrel with sunny days. Good. It would have been bad news had it turned out it wasn't a sunny day. Bad news for the skiff, bad news for the nets. Bad news for the kids. There's a moment's silence. She looks at the slushy snow melt on the yellow belly of the boat. In time, when the sea turns and the wind settles, she will be ready. Waves wash the sand. A skiff moves across the mirror's smooth sea, far away from here. A lone passenger, a fast sloop in the distance. White cells. Are you? Hmm. This says by signing, I agree to living with construction noise. What exactly is the Union building? What a nice idea. Wouldn't have thought that. That Everard and the Union have nice plans for anything. I thought they only cared about themselves. Well. I guess Union members have children, too. 
Aye. Why not? Fine. Here you go. You're welcome. Our tenant, the policeman. I hope the waves don't keep you up at night. What can I... Lillian should let her sword make her decisions. The girl just doesn't have the head for it. Either way, I won't sigh. You need to check your fax officer. I said no such thing. I... Lillian's not the only one who's too thirsty. I've seen it all before. You think they've got our interests at heart? Rich men are always selling poor men promises we never plan to keep. Then the poor get pushed out of their homes and the rich get a little richer. That's the way it goes. So no, I don't trust the fat men and neither should you. She speaks with the authority of a leader. Hers is the final word around here. It's really in her best interest to listen to you. You know how the world works. I've heard that pitch before plenty. Building this, building that, new jobs, new blood. Somehow the people here always end up holding the short end of the stick. Were you dropped on the head as a kid? You can't live off a pittance for long. Do you know who takes the cream off these deals? Real estate developers, construction companies, restaurant owners, Claire's accountants in La Delta. Have some integrity. You're an officer of the law, not some fat slug's corrupt little crony. It's okay. She's emotional right now. Keep at it. We're her out. Take the legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. Underneath all this, Lillian's signature and an empty line waiting for a signee. There is no loophole. The simple truth is the current residents are going to lose their street access and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. Of course, I should have seen it. Eval probably has eyes on us, but if the second signature were to be somehow wrong... He won't say it outright, but he's suggesting forgery. Forgery, yes. It would render the document invalid. It's not the sort of act I would normally encourage, but under the circumstances, if done discreetly, it may be the only way to save what's left of the village. You probably don't have a pen? Here, you can keep this. I have another one. Or you could try to trick Everard. 
Get someone random to sign the document. By the time the union boss finds out, your business here will already be concluded. found in the trash, a cabbage of papers hanging from the board, with the permeables drawer inside. It's barely held together by a clip, then made complete by the faint smell of urinal cleaner. Arson, petty theft, spousal abuse. You don't exactly close them, so much as distance yourself from the smelly papers. They're a little further from your nose. Yes, at last, you find a way to piece them together using the alphanumeric code on the margin. HDB 41, date of initialization and time of arrival on the scene, followed by the title. For example, HDB 41120117000, the next world mural. Why yes, your precinct number is 41. Every last alphanumeric in the files begins with it. And these are your case files. It's safe to say HDB are your initials. Harry Dubois, HDB. Still feels like there's something missing from that. This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight, on 12.02, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking Central Jamrock. The building is a sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Coudon. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible only in the next world for new people it is too late for us wreak havoc on the middle class people call it that thing and that fucking thing it's visible for miles in two days the station's complaints desk gets clogged with requests to remove the bummer you and your partner are assigned to the case the graffito crew is easy to track down only the bell lectures have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the graffito artists is rumored to be rich. They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue of the next world mural, as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. The case files do not show you finding the author of the design. The crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner, JV, is against the removal, citing public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite organized by you and the rest of Row 3. The 9,000 people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villa Lobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rambling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between two options. A staggering 78% of voters choose to keep it. Turns out the opposition were a loud minority, and that love truly is possible in the next world for new people. And it is too late for us. No one cares what you believe in, man with the smelly toilet ledger. What do you want to tackle next? Or are we done? A.K.A. Leslie and Burke. A.K.A. 
the public indecency drunk and the property damage drunk is a cursed case. It has been passed from unsuspecting officer to unsuspecting officer for 10 years. On January 29, the unsolvable case made its way to you. Why you accepted it, it is unclear. Every officer, and indeed most civilians in general, know it's unsolvable. You were so drunk, you didn't remember what it was when you signed on. That, or you were high. Leslie will always take his pants off when he's drunk. Burke will always trash everything. It's just what they do. It is their nature. You cannot change the nature of a man. And you can't lock them away because public indecency and small-scale property damage are not punishable by incarceration. The only way for Leslie to stop flashing his genitals to bypasses and for Burke to stop dismantling signage and rear-view mirrors would be for them to stop drinking alcohol, which in their 40s or 50s, it's hard to tell because of their distorted features, is a medical improbability on par with you ceasing to produce the expression. You would think that, but you're wrong. Where's the fun in exposing your genitals or breaking stuff in your own home? No, Leslie and Burke are on the corner of Main Street and Perdition because that's where the action is. Threatening, fines, dragging them to the station, locking them up in the hell holes they live in, locking them up in the station, hypnotherapy, even trying to get the local gang of Zemiaki to take them out. The Zemiaki gave them ethanol so Burke and Leslie would expose and rampage even harder. You tried it all, and still the complaints wouldn't stop, as they hadn't stopped for 10 years. It's plain to see from the files that you, Satellite Officer JV, and Special Consultant TH, had more important cases to attend to. You uncover cross-reference to several ongoing investigations, each brought to a standstill every time you drive down Main Street because there they are, on the corner of perdition. And what is Leslie doing? Good, you're learning. If the files are to be trusted, that's all there is to it. That and Burke breaking things, and the fact that they're both drunk. But then again, so are you. The case becomes considerably less comic one day, when Burke takes a swing at your ledger. He must have it confused with the property he likes to damage, but the joke's on him. You're drunk out of your mind on potent Pilsner. You slam the hardened plastic board in his face. Then you proceed to beat him unconscious with it. In the process, the ledger sustains damage. The compartment within, reserved for permeable documents, is jammed shut. You stop your assault on the now unconscious Burke to open it, but are unable to do so. The officer began to cry, reports Leslie who, at this point, is tending to Burke. Kill them. They broke it. He came at us, and at us. I think he was trying to kill Burko. While trying to kill Burko, you slowly come around. The permeable's compartment is open. You've smashed it open on poor Burko's kneecaps. The good news is, Burke can't walk anymore. Can't get out of his apartment, an invalid. With Burke to tend to, Leslie cuts back on the indecent exposure. Maybe he flashes his genitals to Burke. Who knows? But both drunks are off the street. The complaints stop. The unsolvable case is solved. Which is also why the officer responsible narrowly escapes a disciplinary hearing. The end. Do you want to read another one? It would be very interesting to read about these, wouldn't it? I mean... There seems to be a square-shaped entry wound in the victim's forehead. She's been sitting there for weeks, on her rocking chair, with a square hole in her skull, staring at the wall, her mouth agape. That's all you got. From the half hour you've spent piecing it together, all you know is the entry wound was square-shaped. You never found the bullet, and then, Another body showed up, also with a square hole in his forehead. Who knows? Those pages are missing. What next? Don't worry. One day. 
Some assholes brought their couch outside and hung out on it. In the middle of the street, on the roof, on the hillside by the motorway. You know, at an unexpected location. They were young and they thought they looked cool on it. Insufferable dicks. Young people are the worst. So anyway, you got a complaint about the damn sofa, or couch, or whatever it is. They were leaving it out in all these unexpected and whimsical locations. They took it to, where they also took photos of themselves on it, and smoked cigarettes, and drank coffee because they felt it's intellectual. Cigarette butts, coffee cups, stupid couch. You had to clean it all up, and you did. So congratulations to you. Case solved. No, you didn't have time for that. These notes show that you have what is called a real goddamn job. You don't have time to be chasing down the couch assholes. You have a real job to do. What next? Murder. Tum tum tum. At the hookah parlor was a case originally assigned to an officer called Joseph Mills, who is now dead. Of circumstances completely unconnected to murder at the hookah parlor. Joseph Mills was on this case that he just couldn't solve. Was doing it solo. Said it was a real nutcracker. A real brain twister. Was on it for, like, a month. The captain got impatient. Shit or get off the pot, Mills. Mills didn't get off the pot. Not yet. He kept at it for a couple of weeks more. Racking his brains. Running with every theory as outlandish as they seemed. Still couldn't solve the murder at the Uka parlor. Tough case, he said. Toughest he's ever had. No, he was awful. Awful sense of humor, too. The worst jokes you've ever heard. Really rapey. Still, he'd been on it for months now. Said it was the final case. Said it was uncrackable. That murderer vanished into thin air. That goddamn hookah parlor was all he talked about. Okay, so the case is handed to you because Mills isn't getting anywhere, and you look into it. Here's the setup. A young man is found dead in a hookah parlor. You know, those places where you go and smoke bubblegum-flavored vapor all day. Yeah, so anyway, young man in his twenties found with his skull busted open, right on the floor of the hookah parlor, in the middle of the day. No one else is in there. Only client that day. In perfect health, too. Some kind of movie producer. No one enters. No one exits. He's just sucking on his watermelon hookah all morning. All noon. Like he usually does. He's a regular. No calls. Nothing. Just sucking on the hookah until 1545. Then bam. He's dead on the floor with his skull busted open. Blood everywhere. What happened? How can it be? Mills has no idea. Invisible assassin. Movie deal gone sour. Girl at the counter did it. Nothing fits. Eerie. Man just dropped dead. So you go to the parlor. You see cushions around the table. Tables low, heavy, really sharp edge. See? You can't even read the thing without solving it. Yeah, it was that. Turns out hookah does do something. It turns off your brain's oxygen supply, and you don't notice it until you get up to go to the bathroom. Smoking hookah, didn't you hear? I don't know. Trying to come up with a movie script, maybe. Anyway, that was Murder at the Hookah Parlor. Joseph Mills wasn't a good detective, and about 30 minutes has passed, piecing it together. Next. Not much has changed in the meanwhile. A bunch of sodden papers still sags from the clipboard. It's still not what happens. Fuck this compartment. You should throw it away. Strange. Why does it make you so angry?
you take the legal documents out of the envelope, a 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. Underneath all this, Lillian's signature and an This is it, the scene of the party, the fire pit, cigarettes and empty bottles all evidence it. Not as such, I'm talking about what came after the party scene. Looks like they were here a while, judging from all the bottles. The sunken motor carriage provided them a focal point, like a goose ice sculpture or a chocolate fountain. Looks like it. Hey, let's keep moving, detective. Somehow, he doesn't want to dwell on it. A banged up motor carriage lies half submerged in the icy water, slowly sinking into the Insulindian ocean. Only the cabin top, rear wheels and the engine remain visible. It must be cold and lonely down there, in the icy water. My guess is it started its journey from the plaza, where it biked through the fence. I agree. We should definitely investigate. You get a sudden, sinking feeling. Stomach acid comes up as you look at the motor carriage in the deep, dark, cold water. Why the doom and gloom? It's just a sunken motor carriage. Some motor carriages are bound to end up in the sea. The motor carriage is properly stuck in the ice. Getting it out would require a team of specialists. The logo is too deep in the murky water. You can't make it out, but you do see a monkfish float by. The ice hasn't closed around the vehicle yet. My guess is it's been here since last Saturday or Sunday. Your mocking tone finds no response but the motion of the waves. Yes, quite. Let's wait for the low tide and see what's inside. I don't know. An hour or two tops? As you sit down in the old rusty playground, the world around you becomes very silent. The hinges creak under your weight. Dangerously so. Nothing but the sound of seagulls high above in the sky, echoing like distant laughter. Ice cracks around the blue motor carriage in the sea. Yes, yes, it does. Hmm, let me think about it. The tune on your lips forms a strange yet undeniably beautiful contrast with the surrounding bleakness. The lieutenant gives you a quick glance, then Still looking straight ahead, he joins you with a higher pitched and slightly more melodic trill. The wind blows in the distance behind the church. Some vagrants are having an argument over a bag of tear they found in the reeds. Further away, a flock of seagulls lands. The clouds pass in the sky and the shadow of the swing moves like the hour hand on a timepiece. Thirty minutes have passed. 
Looks like this might take a while. Time to present a good topic for discussion. I'm pretty sure I told you already, didn't I? My dad and mom are both half cellulite. Clouds on the horizon grow darker and the shadow of the swing set keeps climbing. You hear the distant rumble of the city. 30 minutes pass. God, I hope so. Your voice echoes on the water, strange and out of place in the environment. 30 more minutes pass. Yes, 41. What do you think it stands for? A precinct, yes. A police precinct. Precinct 41, your precinct. A massive pit opens up in your stomach, and the most terrible feeling comes over you. You feel like you're about to faint and fall off the swing. Your hands get clammy, and the air tastes sour to breathe. Oh God, Harry. Oh God, Harry. What did you do? No, just nope. Say no to this, Harry. I'm afraid so, yes. It looks like you drove your police motor carriage into the sea after you jumped across a canal. Detective, we don't. A rescue operation really isn't viable at this point. Yes, let's go take a look. A police badge on which you see the photo of a man, you. Some seaweed is stuck to the back. At least something good came out of all this. Encased between two durable plastic sheets is a bluish card with lines of information and a watermark in the shape of the street grid of Revachol West. You see a photo, a name, a rank, a document number, the date of issue, and in the lower right corner, your precinct. The man keeps winking at you with his green gray eyes. The photo is old, no doubt about that. Good choice. A newer photo would look different. Eight, maybe ten years. The guy in the picture is rather good looking. He's got a nice haircut and is distinctly lacking in massive sideburns. What do you think? His face is already contorted by the expression, although it looks less grotesque on him than it does on you now. It looks better on him because he isn't in as much pain while producing it as you are now. Although there's already a hint of that pain, certainly. Don't be fooled. The bad times have already begun. The badge in your hand shines as you rotate it, catching light. You see lines of information on it and a shining watermark. Harrier, that's long for Harry. So you are a Harry. Everard was half right. Probably not a lot of people know your full name. Whoever told him your Harry Dubois didn't. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Harrier Dubois. 
He's not going to call you Harrier. He'll keep calling you Officer when he's angry with you, and Detective when he's not. The badge in your hands shines as you rotate it, catching light. You see lines of information. Lieutenant W. Freighter. The Lieutenant is a rank above Sergeant and below Captain. It's the highest rank in the RCM that still does field work. I am a Lieutenant. The title of Yefrator is added to your rank when you decline a promotion to a higher rank. In your case, Captain. You have declined twice, thus your double Yefrator. There are many reasons one would do this. The rank above you in your precinct's décontage might be taken. Or sometimes promoted officers do not want to replace their superiors out of respect. And sometimes they just prefer the type of police work available to their current rank, in your case, Lieutenant. Heavy duty case solving machine. Decontage is the hierarchical system employed by the Revachol Citizens Militia. It means counting down to twos. The lowest rank is junior officer, usually teenagers. Then there are the patrol officers, then sergeants, lieutenants, and then a captain. That's basically it, except for a few kings. Kings like satellite officers and the additionally a freighter rank I already explained. The long and short of it is, you're his superior. My pleasure. Such a small yet precious thing. Ex That's just the serial number. Revachol, Jamrock, Precinct 41, with some numbers thrown in there for good measure. Four months ago. I'm guessing that's when you were promoted to the rank of Lieutenant W. Freighter. A new badge usually comes with a new rank. You seem to have been doing well then. The pain in your chest tells you you were working yourself to death to earn that rank. The case created a lot of edge you have to take off. The death march really gets us going. A lot can happen in four months, especially in winter. The winters are never easy on you, of that you are sure. I remember that time! That was a good time! We had a good work-drink balance going! What happened, man? Pump it up! Yes, it's the designation of your precinct. 41, like mine says 57. The 57th is mostly industrial harbor, a lot of asphalt. The 41st is... It's a tough station to work in. You have all of Jamrock to cover. That district should have three precincts, but money is what it is. It's no wonder you are like you are, he thinks. But then again... But then again, it's a legendary district and a hell of a station too. It must be an honor and a curse to work with people like Price, McCoy, Berdiaeva. And you? Is it an honor to work with you? Don't ask him, ask yourself. The badge in your hand shines as you rotate it, catching light.
familiar set of tire tracks in the brown slush that covers the plaza mosaic. Cop habit. You look at everything. This isn't case related, you think. Hard to say. The tire tracks were left here by an unknown event that took place some days ago. It's a message written in the language of burnt rubber. Some of that rubber stuck to the tiles right in front of the whirling in rags. This is point A. The driver started there and then accelerated straight into the fence, left a hole big enough for the Franco-Nigerian cavalry, according to the cafeteria manager. Why that pang of guilt again? The driver proceeded to back out of the yard, barely stopping before hitting the adjacent building. Before heading south, must have been in a hurry. No wonder the cafeteria manager seemed frustrated when he was giving us directions to the yard. Well, you did provide us with a very convenient access point to the crime scene. It can't hurt you. You're a different person now. Stronger, healthier, and all right. Maybe not healthier, but it's a bonus that you've drunk so hard you can't remember any of your past relationships. Oblivion's the ace in your corner. There's a light buzz as you press the doorbell, waiting for her to answer the call. It's cold outside, and you can hear the wind blowing into the speaker. A strange metallic taste fills your mouth as you stare at the intercom. There's the static again, whispering like a seashell pressed against the air. Yes, hello, this is Tricentennial Electric. Have you come to place an order? Here come the bad vibes again. Relax. Distance yourself from it. It's you. My God. I didn't think I would hear your voice again. Wait. Is she... from the intercom doesn't answer, but you can hear her breathing. Wind blows into your microphone again, crackling and echoing in the box. Your hands are getting cold and your breathing becomes visible, forming small silvery puffs in the air. Ever since I came to work here, it's been as if, as if my mind has been wiped clean. It's so nice. It's so nice to be able to finally forget about you. And then it hits you. She tries again not to cry and still doesn't succeed completely. Her quiet sobs sound old and distant as if her voice is being played off a wax cylinder. Real or not, 
your mirror neurons react. It feels painful to be listening to this. Anger boils up in your chest. Her sound melts into the static from a long distance phone call. From time to time, you can hear people talking in the distance, but can't make out any words. This is where you hung up the call the last time, but the recording is still going. A phone rings in the office with an old fashioned chime and someone walks by in a pair of heels. The static is like a warm blanket wrapped around the sounds. No one replies, but the static grows stronger like rainfall. Then a female voice speaks out, completely different from the one before. Glorious and total somehow, crawling inside your head. Her words are too cold to comprehend. She smells of sodium lights and rain streaks on car windows. Eyes like pilot lights watch your shape in dark hallways, guttering. So... It was a recording trapped in the circuitry from some ancient tenant. This sometimes happens. Shall we conclude here? We have other mysteries to solve. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to explain it to you right now. Maybe sometime later. Don't take this the wrong way, but during our short stint working together, something weird is almost always happening to you. That is true. John Damarie, you found me. It feels like a Friday. He seems to be in a good mood tonight. And his shirt is still unbuttoned. Beautiful. So tell me, are you here to make things right again? Then I have some good news for you. My Sunday friend is visiting me tonight. I told him about you and he'd like to say hello. Step in, he's already waiting. That's nice, but I don't have anything to tell you. It's my friend you're looking for, not me. He takes another drag of his unfiltered cigarette and looks around. It's getting dark, and the neighboring windows have lit up. One. Downstairs, a cat crosses the yard, disappearing into the bush. Besides, I've got to run. He's going to leave you alone again. That's sad. To the city. It's a beautiful night. A man on high heels stumbles out of a basement club, music blasting over the entire district. It's chilly. And as the chemicals hit his nervous system, a thousand shivers ripple through his body. Something flutters in the corner of the lieutenant's mouth as you're saying those words. We'll talk. Just not tonight. Take care, all right? Different, of course.
something so mysterious about the way he talks. Very. Come on, detective, let's go. We've got a potential witness to interview. His Sunday friend, remember? Officers of the Revachol Citizens Militia. You shouldn't be seeing him in an intimate setting. For some reason, you feel this man is your superior. Superior, but he's not in the command chain. My name is Charles Vildrouin, and I am an official with the coalition government. I work for the Institute of Price Stability on assignment from Sur la Clé. I heard you talking to my friend outside. Very good. Super. I am here to assist you in any way possible. Ask me about the hanging. No, first ask an innocuous personal question to get the interview off on the right foot. Yes, make it clear you're the one setting the terms here. Yeah, let's fuck with him. Who does he think he is? Assisting you? Of course. Let me just say it has been an emotional week for me. The lieutenant takes out his notebook and nods to you to proceed. I'm sorry to say I did, officer. Easy, detective. No need to jump to conclusions. Officer, it's very difficult to describe what I saw that night. It was so surreal to me, like in a play. What do you mean, like in a play? It was just so strange. I could barely comprehend what was happening. I was on the balcony when it happened, getting some fresh air. I remember that first they came in, carrying what looked like a body. And then I saw all the surrounding windows go dead, one by one. That's when I understood. I should not be seeing this. Sounds like the victim was unconscious, or at least incapacitated. Interesting. I couldn't see their faces well, and there were quite a few of them. But they were very loud and very... Martinez. Let's just say that the laboring classes can get rather expressive with their profanities. 
I couldn't tell you exactly. Less than ten. Maybe eight? The lieutenant sends you a sharp look at the mention of that number. That's a giant you're describing. No, they were all quite human, as far as I could tell. Drummers? Why? No. But then, I don't know what a drummer is supposed to look like. I think we can drop the drummer angle. That was my bet. I went back inside. Yes, back inside. Keep yourself safe from the killing. Were you able to see anything from inside? Officer, the yard was pitch black. There was nothing to see, but I could still hear their voices. They were threatening to kill that poor man. All men, I presume. But again, I couldn't see very clearly. Hmm. But we are fairly certain the lady driver was present. It's possible, officer, but I cannot say with certainty. It was very dark, you must remember. Those funny... Oh, officer. That kind of language is unbecoming of an officer of the RCM. I believe they were mostly white, though I believe I saw two Aeropagites among them. And I am quite certain that one spoke with a mask accent. Well, that's the strangest part, officer. Nothing happened. It was oddly quiet for a public lynching. Eventually, their shouts died down, and that was all. There were no gunshots, no celebratory shouts, no anything. You're right, of course. That is what one is supposed to do in such circumstances. I was simply in shock. I'm afraid I don't have anything else to add. About what time was all this happening, approximately? All I can say is that it was late. No, I didn't see the corpse until the following day. It seems this wasn't the break you were hoping for. I think we have everything we need. Thank you for talking to us, Mr. Villedroin. Of course, anything I can do to assist the RCA. The Coalition is only looking out for the price stability. Inflation is a killer, like a heart disease blocking the normal circulation of the economy. It must be controlled. The economy impacts the entire international community, which is why it requires international oversight. Ah, well, I'm renovating it. It is an interesting project. The building used to be a 12-story skyscraper before the cannons took the top four stories off. This, of course, happened when the Coalition forces landed here. You could say I'm undoing some of the material damage the international community caused when we arrived here. Yes, as I said before, I am a commissioner from sur la -Cle, working for the Institute of Price Stability. This is one of the main projects of the Moral Inter. La Communauté Internationale is what Rivacholians colloquially call the Coalition. In other words, the nations that stopped the disaster of the revolution. Your employer, technically speaking. The governing authority of Rivachol. The RCM is but one part of this provisional administration. It is the most important thing. It's the central goal of any sound monetary policy. Maintaining the price stability is essential to maintaining high levels of economic activity, which is essential for maintaining high levels of employment, which is essential for maintaining the social stability. Basically, it makes sure the price of bread doesn't change. Precisément. Too much inflation, bread becomes too expensive. Too much deflation, it becomes too cheap for bakers to produce. That's why the Institute of Price Stability works to keep inflation just below 2%. But not too far below, no. Too below is also bad. Below, but close to 2%. The Coalition believes in the importance of informing the public about the benefits of the price stability. Transparency is one of our principles. 
Would you like an informational pamphlet? A sound monetary policy is essential for addressing uncertainty. Stability is the raison d'être of the moral inter. It's the reason why I identify as a moralist. But oh, I don't have my leaflets on me today. That's too bad. You can always call our information line. Making information available is part of the moral intern's commitment to transparency. It's the International Organization for Moralists, hence Moralist International. The Institute of Price Stability is just one of its many mind babies, as is the coalition. There are more nefarious powers to work for than the moral intern. But of course. Because moralists believe in a normal, stable world governed by democratic values. Hmm? Me? I, uh, I'm a lieutenant of the RCM, dedicated to maintaining law and order in Ravachol. A very moralist answer. The lieutenant is practiced in the art of putting on a show for one's superiors. Martinez? No. Martinez is something else. Rivachol is generally difficult. It's led by an interim government, which means it hasn't yet achieved full democracy. But they are working towards it. You're all doing very well here, relatively speaking. Is this option D usually the most reasonable answer? Not boring, my friend. Responsible. Moralism is all about compromise and achieving the achievable. It's pragmatic, realistic, and level-headed. An ideology for doers. Are you a doer, my friend? It looks to me like you are. Now, enough of this delightful political interlude. Was there anything else you wanted to ask? What's there to say? Sur la clé is a modern, urbanized country that measures very high on the human development and freedom index. Mostly, though, it's known as the executive heart of EPIS. Moreover, it is a great sponsor of less emerged countries. Revachal is only one of its many darlings whose progress it supports and cherishes. Because a great percentage of Revachal's culture hails from sur la clé, its language, its people, its cuisine even, or at least in the downtown La Delta area. Jamrock and other parts of the international zone have been mercifully spared of sur la clé's love for meatballs and mashed potatoes. Whatever you wish, officer. Ah, my friend. My friend is a good young man. His family immigrated here from Kedra, and life has not been easy for him. But he understands the importance of education. He has taken his future into his own hands, and that's all that matters. Kedra is a candidate member of APIS. But, between you and me, their potential membership is a more contentious issue that it's never going to happen. They enter negotiations in 21, and it's been pending ever since. EPIS is a very special program developed by the Moral Intern to support certain Occidental nations. It began as a unified system of weights and measures, which proved to be a wild success. Nothing but kilograms and centimeters as far as the eye can see. It was such a wild success that we expanded it into an economic union for the processing of steel. Another success. And between you and me, the moral in turn feels emboldened by this success. Emboldened to take EPIS to the next level. A supranational political alliance. The United States of Occident. You mean Revachol? 
No, it's going to have transparent democracy. It's one day going to be a candidate member of EPIS, sure. No, no, candidate members do become members. Why do we even have the whole system in place if they don't? It just takes time. Time and evaluation. But we were talking about my friend here, not politics. How did any of us become friends? Bad things happening on the insulin Insula? Oil platforms ablaze in the night. Civil wars lasting for years. Finally, the international community is forced to step in. Au contraire, it's how millions of people end up where they are. Meeting the people they meet. It's how I came here, and my friend too. Sorry, who? But I told you, officer, he's a bright young man here to pursue his education. Education is the foundation of our future, especially the arts. It is a cornerstone of our civilization. Officer, you have to understand. I can't give you his personal information. I'm sure you have your own methods and databases, right? Please don't put me in this situation. He's deeply enmeshed in the study of the fine arts, yes. He's a truly free spirit. He likes all the arts. Perhaps graphic design, printmaking, who knows? The world is open wide for a talented youth like him. I'm just enjoying the view. Listen. The baby is crying in the neighboring apartment. No, listen. The Insulindian Bay. This place used to be a luxury accommodation before the revolution. Apartments, of course, were much bigger then. A few walls have been added here and there, leaving some of the tenants without a private bathroom or a kitchen. But the million real view stays. You can't take that away. My friend comes and goes. I'm sure you'll see him around. He's a busy bee. I'm all ears, officer. A moment, officer. Do you have everything you need from me? I'm afraid we won't have the chance to speak again once you leave. It's against diplomatic best practices for an official in my position to be discussing murders with local militiamen. And I'm pressed for time. After you leave, I should be leaving as well. Sure, go ahead. It's a beautiful space. Let me know if you have any further questions. Was there anything else? Of course, I'm... I help you? What is this thing?
Cool. Okay. I was really hoping not to think about the cock carousel any longer because it made me feel like shit. But this is a competent piece of taxidermy. Well, I can fix it to the plaque and have a new bird in the establishment, I guess. So, I don't know. Thank you. I'm gonna go with thank you. People just don't know how to accept gifts. Especially taxidermy. He likes it. He likes the bird. It solves his broken bird problem. This was mostly about the fucking cardio. Massive cardio here. You'll live till 90. Or you get a heart attack from running. I feel good about our work here today. It's all about the little things, like bringing people random stuffed animals. Yes? Yes. Uh, um, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps... Uh, I'm not really sure about this turn of events. I think the mutton chops might have been a better idea. They sort of seem to cover up some of the... Um, Damage. Either way, good on you. The tear machine stands, your bottles clunk into the machine, and the... 